Today, I am joined by someone who I've listened to for the best part of a decade since I discovered the Graylian Report. A writer, podcaster, researcher and lecturer, Micah Hanks is a man whose interests span history, archaeology, science, the study of unidentified aerial phenomenon and Fortiana in general. It's my great pleasure to welcome to Mysteries and Monsters, Micah Hanks. Hey Paul, how are you? I am absolutely delighted. Thank you so much for joining me today. Well, it's been a long time coming. Uh, of course, I don't know if you've mentioned this to your listeners, uh, but in addition to having listened to me, you've written to me in the past, and we've kind of corresponded and everything. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm really glad to uh, uh, be on your podcast and uh, be seeing more about the work that you do and, of course, to just be in touch in general. These are really important times to be in touch, aren't they? <laughs> Absolutely, and I think I'm taking advantage of this by uh, trying to arrange as many <laughs> as many interviews with people I respect as I possibly can, Micah. So thank you for, uh, for agreeing to join me. That's my pleasure, man. So... As as I mean, I'm kind of biased in the fact that I, I've listened to you for, you know, as I touched on in the introduction for, for a long time. You were the second paranormal Fortean podcast I, I discovered that I, I discovered you by listening to uh, our probably premier show, The Unexplained with Howard Hughes, which you were on oh, must be 2010, 2011, I believe. A while back. And, you know, I actually recently did another show with him and uh, ah. I'll just add. Yeah. Yeah, it had been a while since I was on with Howard, and you know Howard was uh, actually doing the show, as he'll be telling his listeners on the uh, on the air. He's been doing his show from his house some of the time, at least, because of all of the social distancing and the things that everybody's having to kind of cope with right now. So it was really good to get back on the mic with him, but it was uh, arguably one of the most unusual interviews uh, given the circumstances. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, yeah, I, Howard being a you know a radio guy of many years, and in my opinion, one of the very best, mm -hmm. and also a friend in this field. And he, like so many others, broadcasting from home and the like. So it's it's always uh it's always interesting when you get to kind of change up your your scenery a little like that. But of course, being the pro that he is, you know, Howard's always on top of his game. So yeah, and uh, he is indeed one of the premier voices, not only over there, I think really anywhere. <laughs> well, you know, going all the way back to when I was a kid, my mom and dad always were really interested in these sorts of subjects. I think my dad approached things a little more skeptically. And my mom was an artist. And so she was kind of fascinated with the unexplained especially the supernatural dad you know his interests were a lot more on the side of the sort of physical and tangible things and he absolutely loved cryptozoology and in his library and that was one of the wonderful things i wish that every child growing up could have a library upstairs uh, like i did and it was kind of interesting for me because it seemed to me that the books that were further up the shelf keep in mind i was a little guy i was a tyke i was about you know four or five years old and the books that were further up the shelves, you know, were the, the ones that were the most mysterious. Sometimes I could only read the words or make out a little of the image on the spine mm. of some of these books. And it really uh, kind of captured my imagination as a kid. I always felt like those things literally just out of reach were where all of the knowledge of the world uh, may be contained. And so I would hear these stories. And I remember uh, seeing one particular book. Uh, which I actually still have, by the way. It's now in my library here at my underground facility deep beneath the Appalachian Mountains in western North Carolina. Uh, it, it was a copy of a book by Ivan Sanderson called Abominable Snowman, uh, Legend Come to Life. And uh, Abominable Snowman was a book that was about a lot more than just you know the what the name would seem to entail. Yes, of course, the Yeti of uh, Nepal and other regions they have different names in different parts of the world but in that general part of the world the himalayas of course being the most famous alleged hotbed that mountain range but again that was a term at the time that sanderson wrote that book that was applied sort of more broadly uh, in fact in that book when he's talking about the north american counterpart for that the sasquatch he's referring to these as abominable snowmen of the americas mm. which is charming i mean in those early years yes we had terms like sasquatch yes the newspapers at that time had begun to report things and call it bigfoot that nickname you know just like flying saucer mm. was something that was attributed to that by the press at the time but you know sanderson it was early enough that sanderson was still uh introducing a lot of humorous terms into the lexicon. He was saying things like Sasquatchery. <laughs> you get talking about the abominable snowmen of the Americas, often seen in places where there was little or no snow. Yeah. Um, and interestingly, uh, although Bernard uh, Huvelmans is often described as the father of cryptozoology, no one would dispute that, 
Uh, little known fact, it was old Ivan Sanderson who probably coined that term, cryptozoology. Mm -hmm. And so that book, I remember on the spine of that particular paperback edition, there was you could see the hand of one of the creatures on the cover of the book kind of spilling over onto the spine of the book, and you could just see that, that ape-like hand, and I was fascinated by that as a child. And so eventually... Mom and Dad let me have those books and others like it, Ray Fowler's UFOs, Interplanetary Visitors. Uh, there was one book that absolutely stood out. It was Peter Burns' book, uh, The Search for Bigfoot, Man, Myth, or Monster. I recently had to buy another copy of that, Paul, mm. and, and even actually reached out and got to speak to Peter Byrne. He's in his early you know, hundreds now, and yeah. <laughs> he's one, still involved. But anyway... The long story short is, yes, I mean, having that library upstairs, seeing those books, I was fascinated by those things. Mom and Dad were kind enough to let me read those books and occasionally destroy them, too, you know, inadvertent, <laughs> doing what children do. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I, I was very lucky enough to speak to Peter last year, um, and, and it was an absolute honor. Because I just, like you've just touched on there, Micah, um, I think he's 94 now. Oh, um, is he 94? Okay. Yeah, but, he, you know, regardless, still out there, you know. <laughs> Still searching, I, and it just takes my breath away because he's he's one of those people that you know I'm I'm mid forties, and as long as I've been interested in this subject, I've known about this chap and seen him and heard him and and read about him and read his work. So uh, when you, to my to my chagrin, I'd kind of lost as I touched on earlier. I'd kind of lost touch with a lot of what was going on in and what had been happening in cryptozoology through the nineties and the noughties. Um, so to to rediscover and. and see that he was still out there and doing it just it, it really gave me a, a an incredible sense of of awe of the man oh absolutely i'm actually glad to hear he's a little younger than i thought he was <laughs> because yeah because i hope he's got a few more years involved but yeah mm -hmm. when I, I talked to him last year also and i haven't aired that full interview yet because i have plans for a a sort of supplemental show on more on the subject of cryptozoology from an anthropological mm -hmm. perspective and uh due to his age of course mm -hmm. Uh, one wants to make sure that, for the record, that you've got, you know, a a record of conversation. And uh, like I said, uh, with any luck, Pete will be going for a few more years. But I mean, at that age, you said 94. Mm. Yeah, I mean that he's still involved. And he, I asked him, I said, you know, have you been following any recent developments there in Oregon? And he says, yes, there are two cases. And he told me about them mm. uh, that he had personally investigated, where he'd spoken to the witnesses, gone to the site, gone to the location. And that's so inspiring because, again, like you, I grew up watching Peter Byrne on television shows. And actually, many of those TV shows and documentaries for television were before my time. I was born in 1983. Mm. And I'm hearing a lot of these these accounts and the stories that he tells. I read his book as a child, bought it again recently, reread it, uh, bought the updated version of it. I mean, this guy, in my opinion, is one of the most down to earth, but also one of the most authoritative and no nonsense authorities on this topic. And yeah, getting to talk to him, boy, if there was ever a bucket list, you know, moment, that was it. Yeah, I completely concur with your opinions there, Micah, because it's uh, it's awe inspiring, really. And like I said, because he's he's his, his his entire life story is, is is a film in the making and 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 it's so it's so varied and and to start you know as a as running a tea plantation in india after the second world war yeah it's just his whole life is just like a 70 70 years of adventure it's amazing oh yeah and you know i hadn't heard about the tea plantation bit until i heard uh on laura Krantz's fine mm. podcast wild thing where yeah. she one of those supplemental episodes she did where she featured a, a more extended interview with Pete, which was which was fantastic, by the way, because it focused less on cryptozoology and more on his early life. And there were all these kinds of you know, stories that were being shared. And yet, on the other hand, I'm also thinking, OK, I get it. I see why they did that. But if Pete's going to be on the microphone and talk about this stuff, why in the world wouldn't you spend more time talking with him about Sasquatch? <laughs> For a podcast on that subject, and that that actually, again, with full respect to Laura, I think she did a fantastic job with that mm -hmm. show. I think everyone really should, whether you're new to the subject or whether you're a longtime fan and, and you've read all the books like Paul has and, and like I tried <laughs> to do, you know, then, yeah, I think everyone should listen to Laura's podcast. But, um, yeah, that, that actually caused me to reach out to Peter Byrne. When I heard him on her show, I thought, maybe I can get him too. And I'm glad you did because, again, mm -hmm. I think he really has some some ideas and some perspectives that are of merit and it's important to have those in the record with regard to this topic. Yeah, absolutely. Because I think it's it's one of those things that 
often, especially in, in crypto as well as you know, I, I suspect you will probably say it occurs in all aspects of of the the weird and the paranormal and ufology that obviously Peter's four horsemen and, and the I wouldn't necessarily suggest ego bashing that was going on and, and the, the fallouts and everything are very well discovered. But these were essentially a, a group of intelligent, determined men who were all trying to prove the same thing. Um, and for us to to still be able to to dip into that well of knowledge while Peter is still out there, I think should be encouraged. But not that I'm saying everybody should harass Peter for, for a chat. But it's he's he's a living legend in this field. He certainly is. Yeah. And you mentioned the four horsemen there. Uh, there was a fantastic documentary that was made. I think it's on Amazon Prime and you can certainly uh, rent it online as well. But uh, now what was it called? I think it's probably called something memorable like Sasquatch, you know, like most of these documentaries are. But uh, the, the one in in. Uh, that I'm that comes to mind. I'll have to uh, dig it up and actually uh, get that information for you because many viewer viewers have probably uh, probably seen this. It uh, is notable for having featured interviews with essentially all of those so-called four horsemen of cryptozoology, who are Grover Krantz, Rene de Hendon, uh, Peter Byrne, and John Green. Those were the the sort of four horsemen of Sasquatchery, to borrow. Ivan Sanderson's term, uh, and they were all still alive at the time that this particular documentary was done, and a number of other uh, experts appear on camera as well. But the point there is that, again, you had these four guys, and in the early years, many of them were actually working together. If anything, Krantz actually comes to the game a little later. You had John Green out there, uh, I believe in, uh, I think he was in Klamath, right, or somewhere thereabouts, and he was – he was a, a guy who owned a newspaper, had a bachelor's – no, no, I'm sorry, a master's degree in journalism. And he's reporting on the developments initially, kind of comes at this very skeptically, and then he begins to be more and more convinced and goes on to write a number of notable books from this journalistic perspective on Sasquatch. In my opinion, being a journalist, his writing also is some of the most entertaining and enjoyable. Uh, I mean this is a compliment. He has a very simple and direct way of speaking and writing that it just conveys the information in a great way on on the page or you know when he was on the microphone. Uh, then you had Peter Byrne, who had already been involved with some of Tom Slick's investigations into the so-called abominable snowman, mm. and who ends up being tasked with coming to the United States and gets involved in the Northern California and Oregon episodes with Sasquatch. And then Rene Day Hendon, this other guy who's kind of the maverick in the field. <laughs> you know, he was fun. He had a funny accent, and he. Uh, had a lot of uh, unique ideas in a lot of ways. I mean, talk about a mind like a steel trap. He was very, very, very antagonistic towards some of those guys uh, at times. I think that was just part of his personality. But while Pete kind of just takes off, does his own thing, and is involved in research from the angle of having you know, funding from scientific organizations mm -hmm. to try and get out there and find these things if they exist, De Hinden kind of falls out with Green uh, Grover Krantz, the anthropologist, gets involved and says, well, science, you know, needs to study these, not just, you know, the weekend warriors. And furthermore, we have to kill one of these things if we're ever going to really prove that they exist. They hadn't agreed at first. And then later on, he starts kind of gravitating more toward the no kill stance, as Peter Byrne, notably former big game hunter, uh, started to do more and more with time. And of course, he by the time he was appearing on television in the 1970s, he was the supreme conservationist. And of course, say, no, we need to protect these things. But yeah, you, it's interesting to me, uh, maybe from the social science perspective of things, to see the way that the conflicts between those personalities begin to kind of drive wedges. Some of them got along. Some of them, like De Hinden and uh, and John Green, or De Hinden and uh, Grover Krantz, they absolutely ruffled each other's feathers, and it's kind of <laughs> fascinating to watch. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, one of the things I've I've discovered in the in the last year or so, Micah, is, is a wonderful world of, of documentaries that were made sort of in the 1970s, which obviously living in the UK, I was completely unaware of. Um, and, and there's so many of them featuring those four particular gentlemen, along with two or three other well-known researchers at the time. And for me, it's a it's a gold mine because I never knew these documentaries existed at all. Right. Yeah. And again, that's part of the problem is so many of these documentaries Actually, a lot of them you can watch for free on YouTube, mm. uh, but but most of them have, yet again, these memorable names like Bigfoot or Sasquatch or Sasquatch Bigfoot or The Search, <laughs> well, the search for Sasquatch. And so 
sometimes differentiating between them can be a little tricky at times, but uh, I guarantee you if you go on YouTube and search for Bigfoot or Sasquatch, you're going to find a bunch of, you know, junk. Some of it's, you know, good, some of it's not so good, but uh, if you look for those early documentaries and you type in, you know, Peter Byrne or you type in Grover Krantz or Rene de Hinden, you know, those kinds of names along with the Sasquatch or Bigfoot word will usually bring you some uh, what I think are very interesting and colorful, uh, at times enlightening uh, documentary programs from the 70s. And, of course, there are all those uh, great old episodes of In Search Of. I mean, mm. obviously, that was entertainment. That wasn't anthropology. That wasn't. Uh, real serious science as, as far as cryptozoology, but you did have some people who were very seriously involved in the search for answers about this topic that were appearing on those programs. And so in that regard, uh, some may not agree, but uh, in addition to the nostalgic aspect that I enjoy about shows like that, I do think that there is some merit to what they offer in terms of the personalities and the views expressed. Mm, absolutely. I think they are as well quite a, a a cultural touchstone as well because they give you a very different perspective to to what we expect these days um i mean it's it's a bone of contention i've i've spoken with to to several of my guests Micah, in regards to um whenever any kind of phenomena is is televised in some form um that we unfortunately seem to focus on the sensational and the and the dangerous and the exciting rather than perhaps sometimes the boring reality of certain subjects but i think when you look at some of these uh documentaries that were made in that golden era th they are very scientific whilst being entertaining but they they seem to lack that sensationalism that we that we seem to consume these days well again they, what they also lack is you know ridiculous names uh, i won't give Examples, you know, for respect of all those out there in the television industry who produce programs like this. But, you know, I'll give you an example of the kinds of things that the shows are geared around, hunting or killing Bigfoot or something along those yeah. lines. That you've got an entire television show that is geared toward a bunch of guys out there hunting Sasquatch. I mean, you know, that's the big divide. I mean, in the 1970s, silly though some of those TV shows were, campy and cheesy though it was, uh, poor the production quality might have been at, at their worst. Yeah, they, they brought at least a, a much more sensible and respectful era, I think, than a lot of modern programming does. And by the way, uh, the documentary I was referring to earlier, I was able to uh, find it here, Sasquatch Odyssey. Mm. So that's the name of this one, Sasquatch Odyssey, The Hunt for Bigfoot, uh, that was made in 1999, and it does feature all four of those fellows that we were talking about, so it's well worth a watch. If, I, yeah, if any well, I certainly am, because I've not seen that. <laughs> oh, you'll love it. You'll love it. It's, again, you know, to have right there, right before, you know, a couple of those guys actually uh, passed on from this world. But, yeah, Green, Krantz, DeHinden, and Peter Byrne, they're all in there. So, yeah, and others, too. Right. Excellent. I'm just jotting that down for, for, for uh -huh. future research, because I think the one, <laughs> the one I discovered, which I loved, which uh, I think centers mostly on John Green for, for the best part of it, was The Mystery Monsters. Um, oh, yes. Which Love is, that. I think, yeah. that, was it presented by Peter Graves as well to give it that kind of air of gravitas? It may have. Yeah, but I remember <laughs> that one. That, yeah, that, that is another really, really enjoyable one. Also, again, there are some fantastic researchers of the Sasquatch subject, who have made available on their YouTube channels some really important research. Again, Danny Perez, who I mm. was able to meet a number of years ago. But Daniel Perez, again, you, you're, you'll begin to notice when you're talking with me about this subject, I'm very much interested in people who have documented interviews, information, and things for the historical record, because this may be valuable one day. It's valuable right now. And uh, whether or not one believes in Sasquatch, I still maintain that these things are of importance uh, from a scholarly perspective. But Danny Perez did a fantastic job calling John Green when he was in his you know, twilight years and just you know, calling him and recording conversations, getting him to, to basically get on tape everything he remembered about you know, talking with Roger Patterson and Bob Gimlin just right after the famous film was made there in 67 in Bluff Creek, California. And, I mean, some of the details that John Green was able to remember, of course, we've still got uh, Bob Gimlin. He's around. He frequently appears at events and things. But Roger Patterson died of cancer just a few years after it all happened, which is really, really kind of perplexing because even Bob Gimlin, although I don't think he believes this, but he has been asked and has also posited himself that if if Patterson had been hoaxing me, he never told me before he died. Mm. 
And he said, I strongly doubt that that's the case. I don't think that he was pulling the wool over my eyes. But if that's the case, he never told me about it. Now, that's what happens when we lose people, you know, and it's a part of life. But that's why it's so important for people like Perez and like others and like you and I, you know, having this conversation, you know, get these things on the record. I think that that's going to be so valuable, especially in hindsight, when we look back one day and we have a clearer picture maybe of what this phenomenon represents. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting that you touch on, 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 on I think, which is the, the constant uh, situation that we have or problem perhaps is that you there are two distinct camps in the in, in how to finally put this um, subject to bed in regards to Sasquatch which is do we kill one or or do we somehow try and I don't know tranquilize one and and do that instead I've noticed Probably more so in, as you've touched on about sensationalizing the subject, there seems to be a modern move towards this kind of, well, we've got to kill one. That, that's all there is to it, which I find perplexing as, as someone that loves animals, Micah, and uh, from around the, you know, of all forms and, and <laughs> continents that just amaze me. So what's your feeling on this? I mean, because essentially it is a an ethical question here. Do we have the right to put an argument to bed by taking the life of a creature we have we can't, we have yet to discover yeah, officially. I'll, I'll give you my thoughts on that. Uh, quite simply, no, I don't think we have that right. No, I don't think we should kill one. Uh, now let me make the argument for why. And let me get the following caveat also. Growing up in the mountains of western North Carolina, since an early age, you know, my parents were teaching me archery. We would go fishing when I was a child. You know, yes, I know how to operate firearms, and I don't necessarily love them. I definitely love all animals, and I respect all life. But what I'm trying to convey is that, you know, I have been out there in the field. I understand uh, things like quality wildlife management, and therefore I don't demonize sportsmen and women who are out there and who live off the land and things like that, who are, again, respectful yes. of the land. They were respectful of life, even if they harvest mm. animals and things along those lines. And that's why I think uh, someone like Peter Burns, some people may be mystified. This guy was a big game hunter, and then he turns into a conservationist and says, don't kill Bigfoot. Well, yes, but again, I think part of his background as a big game hunter is what informed his views toward this creature. Now, when he was involved in scientific studies in the 1990s, he had been utilizing darts with cavities that if an animal such as Sasquatch were seen, these could be fired into the creature and then they would eject a dart with genetic information about the animal without actually having to kill the animal. The simple argument, in my opinion, as to why we don't need to kill Sasquatch is that if we have other means by which we can obtain information that would conclusively prove that they exist. And yes, I think we do. We do have tranquilizers. We do have other kinds of sophisticated technology at our disposal, which we did not have back in the glory days of taxonomical research where you had to go and claim a specimen, bag it, bring it back in, and then tag it, right? You know, these days, those measures, I mean, they often are still instituted by a biologist, and that is part of the reality of, you know, scientific process. But there are alternatives, and unlike many other species of flora and fauna in the world, if we have something like Sasquatch, if this creature or anything like it anywhere else in the world does exist, we have a remarkably unusual organism. Actually, maybe it's not. Maybe it's so much like us that it's <laughs> the actual antithesis of unusual, but nonetheless not something we would expect to find hidden right under our noses. But nonetheless, if they are hidden as well as they are, it seems to indicate that there are very few of them. And I have a real problem with saying, let's go out there and shoot one. Now, also understanding the... Uh, the, the proponents of going out there and claiming one for science, their whole purpose in wanting to do that is they say, we do want to protect these animals. It's not bloodlust that drives them. So let's be clear. You know, I think that they also have a conservationist attitude as well. They simply have a different approach to solving the problem than perhaps you or I would. And so I'm not going to demonize them, but I'm going to say that I differ because if we have other capabilities at our disposal – and technology affords us more humane ways of documenting a species like that, we should try to use those first. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it, it is a, a perplexing question because I, I come pro probably from the same kind of standpoint as you. Why resort to the final situation in regards to this subject when, when we have other, other ways of, of proving this creature's existence? It's, it just seems 
it's not about furthering science it's about furthering certain people yes I, I kind of agree with you i mean again there are a lot of organizations that are in operation especially here in the united states that do have a pro kill stance but they also institute for instance um ideologies such as we we our aim is to kill one so that we can prove that they exist so science will qu you know quit sweeping this under the rug so that they'll take it serious but our view is that once one has been killed it should be against the law to ever harm another one and you know that is respectable but it is sad that we are facing something that has and really this to me is all the bigger problem something that is so stigmatized that it seems to encourage those who are advocates of it to think that they have to kill one in order to bring science over to the to the reality of this so and again there may not be a reality to it i get it but i mean i having having read a lot about this over the years my position on sasquatch is i'm troubled by the lack of physical evidence mm -hmm. peter Byrne, you know speaking with peter Byrne, he had said i'll be the first to tell you there's nothing as far as physical evidence that conclusively proves that these creatures exist now there are some footprint castings mm -hmm. There have been some novel uh, instances where skin scrapings, hair samples, things like that have been acquired. But again, the the one sole serious DNA study that was conducted by Brian Sykes a few years ago found no evidence of Sasquatch. And now again, I saw Time Magazine and other periodicals reporting that uh, DNA study proves that Bigfoot is a big hoax, like we didn't think it was already. You know, I'm paraphrasing, but that was the the, the attitude and the idea that was being conveyed. They're like, why is science even pretending that this is something? We all know that this is just a big joke. Well, again, we have to take into consideration the limits of knowledge. People who think from the outset that this is all just a big joke, it's all been a big gag, they're astonished that science would take it seriously. If they have not read the literature, if they are not familiar with the anecdotal data that actually constitutes the very reason some scientists have been compelled enough to take it seriously, of course they utterly fail to understand that Sasquatch could be, not necessarily is, but could be more than a hoax or a prank or a joke or a modern mythology. And so the first step toward understanding that divide is, you know, know the limits of knowledge. People who write about it and say this is unequivocally a hoax, I know that I don't have to read Sasquatch books to know that. Well, that pretty clearly shows they didn't read those books, did they? The few scientists, the few scientists who have, on the other hand, they understand the problem we face. But really, when it comes back to killing Sasquatch and the question over it, those issues cause me to wonder who is actually worse, the hunter or the organization who advocates killing in the name of protecting the creature or the scientists who are unwilling to even introduce the possibility or to go over the anecdotal literature themselves. I mean, who's more at fault for there having to be a body claimed, the scientists or the hunters? In that case, I might say it would be the scientists who are who are prematurely dismissive of the subject. Yeah, I, I, mean, I find it frustrating as well, because obviously, as you touch on there, your, your childhood was, a, uh, you know, you had a, a father who was an interest in science and and i had a a, a similar family dynamic um in regards to that so i had a very kind of curious um academic slant on learning about these things primarily because i you know i had one foot in both camps as it were mark one foot in the in the cryptozoology <laughs> but also keeping my toe in the, on the scientific side as well and understanding about evidence and proof and and not to just accept anecdotal evidence as uh, as 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 the be all and end all of it but so i i i don't understand the stigma of of the of not wanting to prove something categorically is one or the other yeah yeah i agree and i'm like you too again i didn't spend all my times in sasquatch books when i was a kid you know i mean i spent a lot of time in nature studying animals um i knew at an early age that i either wanted to be an artist and draw comic books or i wanted to be a scientist you know i wanted to be a biologist um or or an english professor i loved literature too so <laughs> i was probably the only kid who was in his teens entertaining uh you know fantasies of being an english professor one day what a prestigious lifestyle you know <laughs> And uh, yeah, be, but, but seriously, I, I had those scholarly inclinations. Now, on the side of all of that, I had a serious interest in Sasquatch and, you know, similar subjects. Uh, I loved reading about Architeuthis or the giant squid. And uh, and I always was fascinated by the fact that when I was young, we knew 
because there had been biological specimens that had been recovered, dead ones, of course, of Architeuthis, we knew that there were giant squids. But the interesting thing to me about it was that at that time, we had never filmed a live one. Now, in more recent years, of course, that's become a reality, and we've actually mm -hmm. observed live giant squid in the wild. And uh, that's just been interesting for me, again, because having followed this since childhood, I remember the days back when we were in this period between where, in the days of yore, we had the accounts of the mysterious and monstrous Kraken, right? Mm -hmm. A creature that no one would have believed actually existed until there were actual specimens of the giant squid that were recovered. And then, although we'd never seen a live one, we knew, well, maybe some of these accounts of this quote-unquote mythical creature from the days of yore, maybe they actually are not so mythical after all. Maybe these are based at least on a grain of truth. Mm -hmm. And now, of course, with the aid of technology, uh, you know, with deep sea camera rigs and things along those lines, we've also begun to gather data and observe giant squids in their natural habitat. But again, it was a slow progression over time of the acquisition of information about these things and ultimately finding not only specimens, but also observing them in the wild. I can't help but look at other instances in so-called cryptozoology where we may not have other specimens, other animals. And like you said, you know, there's this, the cryptozoological side of things, and then there's real science. Well, as soon as a body washes up on a beach or as soon as you observe one in the wild, you know, as soon as you've got that physical proof, all of a sudden myth and speculation does become science. Mm -hmm. uh, there are some instances where I feel it is warranted that even before we have had that, whoa, we, nobody expected Sasquatch to exist, and here we've got a body. Now scientists all get involved. Yes. You no, know, there are some instances I think where scientists at least should uh, – observe the possibility uh, before we have that body and, and look and see whether this data entails something that is worthy of study uh, already. And again, kudos to Dr. Jeffrey Meldrum, who is the leading proponent these days, uh, who is still, I think, doing some fantastic anthropological work in that regard. Thank goodness for scientists like him and the late Dr. John Bendernagel. And anyone who hasn't read Meldrum or Bendernagel's scientific writings on Sasquatch, you really should, if you're interested in, in this subject, don't relegate your research to watching TV shows about guys with guns in the woods. You know, go and read what the scientists have to say. It will change your mind about this subject. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it. It, it is fascinating. I mean, the, the giant squid is a is a wonderful example because we both will have grown up reading these wondrous tales of sailors of these monsters of the deep occasionally coming up and, and attacking boats and whatever, or seeing sperm whales with them still wrapped around them. And, and obviously the, the amount of whaling that went on, which event, essentially gave us the first clue, because obviously the only part of a giant squid that a whale can't digest is its beak. Um, uh -huh. So obviously when they sliced all the whales open, the, these giant beaks would fall onto the deck. And they were yes. like, well, where are these coming from? So, And yet, the, it's a prime example. Even though we had these beaks, it was... Well, yeah, until we get one, they're not real. Well, hang on, we've got physical evidence here of, of a monstrous beak <laughs> from from some creature that we, we simply have no concept of. And it took at least, what, 100, 120 years for, for that first one to appear and be finally studied. Yeah, thereabouts. So what you're saying is we need to find out what eats Sasquatch. <laughs> Right? I mean, am I following you right? Yeah, but not, no, no, maybe not. Yeah, I probably didn't use that as the best thing. So. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just. I messing. tell you what, I, oof, I wouldn't like to run into one of those wherever it is, Micah. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Whatever can eat a Sasquatch. Yeah, whatever can best him in a fight. Yeah, I'm, I'm probably not going to get close enough to tear him open and find out what he had for dinner either. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Always reminds me when I, when I spoke to Linda Godfrey and she, she was, was telling me she, she'd had an email once asking her opinion of who would win in a fight between Dogman and Bigfoot. And um, so uh, I would imagine there'll be a trench of, of the subject or, or fans of the subject that will po consider that a possibility, Micah. I suppose so. And, you know, I've got to be honest, I, I'm not really sure where I fall on that whole Dogman thing. Um, and by the way, all respect to Linda Godfrey, too, because, you know, I, I've got a lot of her books. I've enjoyed her interviews and things over the years. Just for my own part is all I'm saying that um, – Sasquatch, see, that's that's what's interesting to me about this subject. Um, the fact that a anthropoid ape, apart from humans, might exist in the modern world seems so impossible to people. And I'm like, why is that impossible? I mean, if you have studied anthropology and if you've looked at the paleoanthropological record, if you look at ancient arche archaic human types and 
and actually not even those closest to us, like Neanderthal and the uh, fairly recently discovered Denisovans and also uh, Homo floresiensis, the hobbits of Flores, mm. uh, and other types. There are other uh, disputed hominin types as well, you know, the Yunnan cave people. Yeah. Um, there is a very uh, enigmatic jaw fragment that has been found off the coast of Taiwan called the Penghu-1 fragment, mm. which appears to be an unidentified hominid from the Pli uh, Pleistocene era. Now, we also have genomic studies where DNA seems to indicate that there is the so-called ghost DNA mm -hmm. of as yet unidentified ancient hominin ancestors that interbred with Homo sapiens sapiens during the Pleistocene. Uh, so we have a lot of evidence, even some that does not exist in the fossil record, uh, for there being ancient uh, types, essentially, of humans that existed, you know, maybe within the last as little as 10,000 to as much as maybe 70 or 80,000 years, which geologically speaking in terms of deep time, that's just a blink of the eye. That's the tip of the finger, you know. So for my own part, I am very interested in the fact that there is so much evidence for things similar to humans that have existed, you know, recently speaking in general terms. And yet people are still so baffled by the idea of something like humans and yet, something which is not Homo sapiens sapiens per se uh, existing in our world. And I'm thinking, you know, that that right there, humans being the only dominant primate, you know, and a bipedal one at that, that is a recent development as far as the ancient human, you know, history and, and lineage of our ancestry. That is a very recent development. I mean, in ancient times throughout, you know, the thousands and thousands of years, hundreds of thousands of years, before humans uh, became the only ones, as we presume ourselves to be today. Mm. I mean, the norm was, and actually uh, my good friend Dr. One Pagan recently said, uh, I love this, he said, well, the, the Earth was actually the planet of the apes. Mm. You know, when we, had, when we had actual hominin varieties living alongside each other and interbreeding like Neanderthals and Denisovans and humans did, we had all these different kinds coexisting, but they were anatomically distinctive from Homo sapiens sapiens for a number of reasons, and which we could get into. But again, the, the broader point here is, is that for anyone who thinks that it's so strange that a creature like Sasquatch could exist, I'm thinking, you know, that used to be the norm as recently as a few tens of thousands of years ago. Now, on the other hand, we look at something like Dogman, and where my skepticism starts to come into play is, I completely understand a creature like a Sasquatch. That makes sense. But something that is some sort of half canine, half humanoid, that doesn't evolutionarily make very much sense to me because unlike the other human-like ancestors and cousins in the fossil record uh, going much further back in time and also uh, fossil primates like Gigantopithecus, which were very unlike humans but might be a dead ringer for something like Sasquatch, you know, I don't see any uh, bipedal hominid-like canine crossovers in the fossil record, and also nothing in the world today seems to suggest that a creature like that would exist. So at least for my own part, where I would kind of fall on something like Dogman, you never want to say people you know, are liars that they, they, or that they didn't see what they saw. But I do wonder sometimes about uh, whether the characteristics that are quote-unquote dog-like might be accounted for in other ways. Uh, could we be talking about a primate instead, and people are either you know interpreting something that they're seeing uh, one way or another, or maybe there are certain exaggerations that would account for that. Mm. Yeah. I mean, the one thing that's always struck me about that, and I, I completely um, chime in with that, kind of opinion is, and like i say some people might think that distinction's ludicrous michael when you can say i can understand how sasquatch or or whatever it is is potentially there it, i can un, i can get that because we've as you refer to we've got the fossil record we've we've got examples of uh hundreds of different types that go back in the lineage that i think half the problem is they're not as sexy as dinosaurs so people don't really know much about ancient primates if you if you get my drift that's um, a good point because you know everybody knows gigantopithecus but you know nobody talks about things like kenyapithecus or or um oh, what's the one of the carapathicus you know there are so many variants of of giant primates that were around in our fossil record and and yet it it, it doesn't seem to be widely known in comparison to you know everybody knows about certain types of raptors and the brontosaurus families it it, it seems that always strikes me as being a peculiar um distinction in the subject well, yes, and this kind of gets over into the discussion of uh, whether or not there's evidence for something like a Sasquatch in both the fossil or in the historical record. And 
uh, in advance of our conversation, you know, I'd mentioned to you that that's something I love to talk about because often I do see skeptics. Um, not to say that they're wrong to be skeptical, but I do differ with their skeptical interpretation of the data. And one of the arguments that's often made is if a creature like Sasquatch existed, look, you know, all these reports are great. But if a creature like this existed, it would have to be in the historical record. There is no historical record for these creatures. We don't find them in the fossil record. And I'm thinking, whoa, hold on. Mm. Is that necessarily true? Now, since we're talking about fossils, yes, you mentioned not only Gigantopithecus, but also the, the other fossil variants of large apes. Um, there are also those on the more human side of things, like Peranthropus, that at various times in various places in the fossil record appears to have been fairly large. Some specimens of Peranthropus from parts of Africa seem to indicate at one time that it was fairly normal for them to be around seven feet tall, which... Here again, really seems to kind of match. I mean, if I've got a big human, hairy or human like hairy guy who's about seven feet tall and most of his cousins, you know, his his family members, they're also around six, seven feet tall, all covered in hair, walking around, you know, on two legs. That sounds an awful lot like Sasquatch to me. So you know, <laughs> on, over here on the on the more human like side of things, then we would presume Gigantopithecus and its kith and kindred to be. You know, you still see some of these ideas that really would kind of match what we're talking about with, with Sasquatch. So, yes, we don't have Bigfoot. We don't have Sasquatch in the fossil record. I get it. We've got all kinds of things that are very similar to Bigfoot or Sasquatch. And that's where the disconnect seems to be. The skeptics are like, you know, well, show me a Sasquatch in the fossil record. I say, well, you tell me what a Sasquatch is. <laughs> you know, at this point... We don't know what this creature is, and so, sure, it's very easy to say, no, that's Gigantopithecus, no, that's Paranthropus, that's Homo erectus, you know, these are not Sasquatch. No, of course they aren't. We identify them by different names, we recognize them by different, you know, things, and, and in different divisions of either human or primate or whatever, but the point is, until we know what Sasquatch is, any number of those things could be an ancestor of or might actually represent essentially the same thing as what we call Sasquatch. Now, the other thing that should be pointed out is the fact that there are a number of extant ape species, primates, that are not in the fossil record. I don't think that chimpanzees were found in the fossil record until just the last few years. There are other varieties that also do not appear in the fossil record. One of the reasons for this is because we have to take into consideration where fossils form. Fossils and fossil formation is not something that in likelihood, due to how fossils form and where they form, it's probably not going to be very feasible that all life forms that have ever existed on this planet uh, will be represented in the fossil record. In fact, I can assure you that's not the case. And then you take a really uh, you know, steep, uh, you know, mountainous, acidic environment like the Pacific Northwest, and if Sasquatch or a creature like that has been inhabiting that region since the Pleistocene, that's, yet again, not going to be an area that is necessarily going to be very conducive to fossil formation. So the fact that we don't have what, again, everyone can agree on as being Sasquatch in the fossil record, that's sort of an odd argument considering how many things that exist today that aren't in the fossil record and also considering how fossils are formed, uh, the conditions that have to be met for them to be formed, and the fact that there are so many things that do exist in the fossil record that might resemble Sasquatch. Mm. Yeah, I mean that's what one of your one of your strong points, Micah, is you're never afraid at, at shining a light on inconvenient truths. <laughs> well, I might have that way, yeah, because again, often people tend to make arguments that are, in my view, very incomplete. What I like to do is rather than pick the pick what I believe and then pick all the facts that support that mm -hmm. idea, when I say, Okay, I'm interested in this and here are all the arguments that support that idea, what I tend to try and do, Paul, is I'll say, Okay, now I'm going to play devil's advocate with myself and debunk my own beliefs. If everybody did that, I think we'd all be a lot better off. You know, I love to challenge myself on my own beliefs, which is what drives a lot of my, you know, listeners nuts because they're like, you don't seem to know what you believe, Hanks. And I'm like, the problem is that most people choose what they believe before they have facts. I try not to, I try to leave belief out of the equation, but I'm more than happy to poke holes in somebody else's faulty argument. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it always falls into a danger of, of not becoming a discipline or a belief, but it just becomes dogmatic. Yes. And, you know, again, a lot of people who are advocates of cryptozoology, they get burnt out with my advocacy of science and good scientists, you know, and even good scientists who might not ever have time for something like Sasquatch. But again, I can't fault 
the late Sir Stephen Hawking for not having been interested in Sasquatch. The guy was a physicist, right? Mm. <laughs> you know, he did his job really well. He spoke very disparagingly of subjects like UFOs and things like that. But again, was he a ufologist? Was he a Sasquologist? No. What Stephen Hawking did, despite tremendous limitations, physical and otherwise, you know, I mean, you cannot say that that man was not a genius mm -hmm. and you cannot admire the hurdles he had to overcome. And yet that man changed history and he changed science as we know it. So, I mean, I, I absolutely admire uh, the late Sir Stephen Hawking, the late mm -hmm. Carl Sagan. Those men were great at what they did. But if we want to study something like Sasquatch, yes, I'd love to see more scientists say, OK, maybe. You know, we'll we'll suspend our disbelief and at least look at it. I'd love to see more of that. But I think it's also incumbent upon those who really do want to study this and take it seriously to also recognize the merit and the strength of their arguments or the weaknesses. Hmm. Well, I think that's the only way any um, situation can develop and, and, and you can learn from it, because once you get past that point, um, I mean, I've I've seen numerous scientists over the years claim that we've discovered everything there is to discover, which I find incredible um, in the in the the arrogance of humanity to assume that uh, a, a small planet in you know, a speck of dust in the scheme of things, Micah, we, we have the answers to every single question in, in the universe that surrounds us. And I just find that arrogance beyond contempt. It's absurd. I mean, it's I, I don't understand where you can where anybody can 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 vouch that kind of statement. And I, I apply that to any kind of scientific discipline, because as soon as you stop pushing the boundaries, then surely that stops. That's that's when science stops, does it not? Well, of course, I recall this uh, anecdote that uh, Dr. John B. Alexander, uh, I think he wrote about this in his book, UFOs, Myths, Conspiracies and Realities. And he talked about attending this conference where a – I believe it had been a physicist in this instance who had gotten up and had essentially said, you know, at this point, 99.9% .9 of everything that there is to discover has been discovered, which, again, anyone who studies math will tell you that 99.9% .9 is essentially 100%, right? <laughs> but, so it's kind of a roundabout way of saying, well – of course, we haven't discovered everything, but we've mathematically discovered everything. And so now what we are as scientists essentially trying to do is we're just trying to tie together some of the loose ends between all of the known observable phenomena that we all know exists because of our complete understanding of the universe. And I'm thinking, guys, no human has even no, no human has even set foot on Mars. Yep. OK, uh, no human has gone further than our lonely little satellite, the moon. Now, we've sent robots out there into space, and they've beamed back some really awesome pictures, and they have studied, you know, places that we haven't gone to yet. But, I mean, and there's a good chance also, of course, that really there will be more and more with time limitations to how far we as humans can really get out there. I mean, I know we all, many, many of us grew up watching Star Wars or Star Trek or whatever, and, yeah, you know, you see these guys get on board a Starship Enterprise and go off, you know, beyond infinity in search of answers about, you know, the worlds beyond our own and things, you know, space, the final frontier and all of this, that is science fiction. It, it is as anyone who has actually studied um, what astronauts do and, you know, the space program, the history of it, um, the incredible hurdles that must be uh, leapt in order to be able to just get to the moon. I mean, again, with the 50th anniversary of Apollo that came around recently, you know, studying what it took to get us there and how difficult that is, it makes it a very clear case for why we haven't gone back and why we don't spend more time up there. It's not an easy thing to do. And so <laughs> my point is, with time, we may see more and more that there are going to be distinct limitations to how far humans can go out there. Now, that may not always be the case. And with more technology and with more advancements in the coming decades and centuries, sure, humans may go fur further and further out. And indeed, yes, survival may actually depend on doing that, as some have said. But... Again, with all of the limitations and the fact that we haven't even gone further than the moon for us to say that we have discovered everything that there is to discover. I mean, it's absurd. It is literally absurd, and it shows how close-minded people are. It's like the, the allegory of the cave, right? You know, and being in that cave and seeing nothing but shadows and claiming that you have, you know, experienced the full essence of reality. That's where we are. We're still in that cave. Mm. Yeah. I mean, it's it's just baffling to me when I when I hear 
any anybody close close a subject down in that matter, Micah, because it's it 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 just frustrates me intensely because one only has to think, you know, a, a layman such as myself in the last thirty years of of the scientific discoveries of things that people had no concept of, you know, even in, as we crawled into the nineteen nineties, things like you know sprites that exist in the atmosphere which are terrifying <laughs> pieces of phenomena that are you know miles wide bolts of energy nobody had the faintest idea they were around 40 years ago oh yeah absolutely and it's also really good to know that in the uh, 0.01% of phenomena as yet unrecognized <laughs> by science that gravity waves yeah. apparently <laughs> that category because yes yeah in, at the time that alexander wrote the book and talked about the anecdote of the scientists getting up and saying that that was well in advance of the discovery of gravity waves and any number, countless. I mean, again, we hadn't made actual visual representations of a black hole yet, as was recently yeah. done. Uh, we still haven't figured out exactly what these fast radio bursts are. Mm -hmm. And I don't think at the time that that book had been written, I mean, I'm sure some astronomers were looking at it, but they weren't really in the modern parlance and weren't covered all the time like they are now. So... Think of all – I could go down the list. I mean there are so many incredible discoveries that are currently underway in the process of discovery being – you know, an actual discovery being made or that were completely off the table prior to that. And here we have this story of this guy saying, guys, we figured it all out. Congratulations. Job well done. And I'm thinking to myself, <laughs> guys, we have barely scratched the surface. Absolutely, because every time you think um, a subject seems to have run its course or whatever – then all of a sudden something pops up. I was I was speaking to someone recently, and we were t we got touched on the subject of dinosaurs again, and I was saying that they're one of those things that every every so often there's just a massive trench of of brand new discoveries. I can think of at least twenty new species that have probably been discovered in the last twelve months, which is an incredible thing. Which to a kid that grew up obsessed with things like dinosaurs, as as I think most young people kids are these days, um. I just find it fascinating that we still continue to push the boundaries of paleontology and archaeology in regards to, to what we discover, because things just keep changing on a on a constant basis in that those particular subjects. Well, absolutely. And, you know, I'll just throw you a couple of curveballs here in that regard, because these are uh, fascinating to me on the paleontological side of things. You know, the idea that a creature, a large creature similar to, you know, saurian species, reptiles from the ancient, ancient past, the idea that something like that could still exist seems completely implausible. Mm. Uh, and, and every now and then we do hear these very uh, colorful encounters and these interesting reports of things like the alleged Mokelium Bembe, you know, from Lake Tele uh, in the African Congo. Now, I've been very interested in those reports, too. But again, it seems highly unlikely that an actual dinosaur would still exist today. Uh, I wouldn't rule out the possibility, however, that maybe a creature – Again, as yet unrecognized by science, but perhaps similar to a giraffe or perhaps similar to a hippopotamus, mm -hmm. perhaps maybe somewhere in between the two. Mm -hmm. You know, something like that might exist and that there is a mammal that perhaps hasn't yet been identified. Uh, not impossible. Maybe it's unlikely, but it's certainly not impossible. But a number of uh, years ago, I had the opportunity to do an interview uh, via email with a woman by the name of Marlene Martin. Uh, I'd come across this report from back in the 1980s. I believe it was 1983, uh, the year I was born. If not, it was 1986, but it was Halloween Day. Marley Martin was basically overseeing a Caltrans operation on the cliffs up above Stinson Beach, California. And they saw something out there in the ocean, well out beyond the beach, swimming through the water. And as this thing is moving along, they had a pair of binoculars. And so she and the other... Um, observers, Matt Rizzo and a couple of others that were there with her, hmm. they were looking at this creature as it swam through binoculars, and they estimated it to be about 100 feet long. They said it was roughly, you know, about the same color of gray, dark gray or black as a tire on a car. Uh, they said that it was about as big around as a large barrel. They said that it had a head that essentially looks just like a snake, but that its mouth was slightly open, and as it swam, they could see teeth that looked like alligator's teeth in the mouth. And that by all intents and purposes, this was a roughly 100-foot-long giant snake swimming off the coast of California. Now, I was a little skeptical of the story, and I wrote an article about this for Mysterious Universe um, a few years back, and a couple of researchers named Bill and Bob Clark reached out to me when the article went live, and they said, hey, you know, we, we pick up on some of the skepticism in your article, but we want to tell you, uh, first of all, my brother, uh, Bob and I, Bill presumably being the one writing, 
Uh, we saw this thing. Uh, second of all, we know Marlene Martin because we're after we saw it, we became fascinated and began involved, uh, became involved in research. Uh, so we reached out to her about your article, and she says she doesn't expect you to believe her, but she'd be willing to talk to you. Mm-hmm. And so they gave me your email, and I wrote to her, and she says, "Look, I don't, you know, it's my, not my job to have to, you know, convince skeptics like you." And I, I kind of said, "Now listen, um, I, I just want you to to know that I I am willing to listen. I want to know everything about this, and I'm I'm not." rule out of hand anything that you've seen so i asked her a number of questions you know i said was there any mane was there anything she says no giant snake this was a giant snake she said the eyes were round she said the teeth were exactly you know triangle shaped just like you if you look at a alligator the teeth were just like that she said as its head bobbed up and down as it swam along it almost had a playful kind of look to its movement but she said it was incredibly eerie to see this thing and she said i wouldn't let my children swim in the in the waters anymore after this she said all of us saw it all of us the caltrans workers were observing from you know above stinson beach at the time Mm. lo and behold paul i go on my show on my radio show and i actually share the story and i get an email the next day from a guy who's like i was there i was stuck in traffic i remember the the highway employees over there, they were looking at something, and he said Stinson Beach had a reputation for being sort of a nude beach at that time. Yeah. He said, we figured they were all looking at the sunbathers down there on the beach. Mm. But he said, I was stuck in traffic, and he says, I got down to the beach afterward, and people were, like, losing their minds because a bunch of the beachgoers had seen this thing swimming out there, too. Now, a lot of people, I had a friend, actually, who said to me, you know, yeah, great, everybody says they saw it. I could maybe buy this if it weren't for the fact that this thing was only seen one time ever. And I said, well, who said it was only ever seen one time? That's kind of a silly thing to say. In fact, there is a history of sightings of creatures like this off the California coast going back more than a century. But again, here is the problem. Most people would have taken those merely for being folk tales. And for all we know, maybe they actually are. But, you know, you can get on newspapers.com with a with a basic level account and you can go back and you can read some of the accounts that appeared in newspapers <laughs> in the decades. The problem is that much like Sasquatch, people who rule that out of hand lead with a, pre, a presupposition that, hey, OK, people might have seen something, but it's not going to appear only once if these creatures actually exist. <laughs> Had they actually been familiar with the the historical narrative, the historical accounts leading up to the present day, they would know Lots of people have at least claimed to have seen similar things, however unlikely that seems. And so this is the problem with a historical record. We we talked about the fossil record. Many people will say things like, well, for a creature like Sasquatch to exist, it must be in the historical record, and there is no historical record. Question, is there no historical record, or have you simply not read it? Have you simply not done that research yourself? Mm. And I think that, you know, whether we're talking about a giant snake off the coast of California, you know, and again, I reserve judgment on that just like anything else. I can't say that Marlene didn't see what she says that she saw. And in fact, her her report was incredibly compelling to me, but I didn't see it myself. And of course, this species, whatever that would be, is unrecognized by science. And it seems incredible that a giant snake like animal might still be out there in our oceans. But Mm. Again, as scientists, if they are out there, you'd think that it would really be beneficial for us to try and study the historical record and see if one exists before we say there is none. Notable uh, instances involve, uh, of course, the famous Daedalus sighting from the HMS Daedalus. I think that was in 1846, maybe. Mm. Uh, Captain Peter McQuay and his crew all essentially observed this large creature swimming uh, just a short distance away from the boat. Uh, McQuay actually published a number of, of uh, missives about this in the in the uh, newspapers at that time, and rather famously, Sir Richard Owen. Again, here we here we have the actual guy who essentially is credited with the discovery of di- of dinosaurs, and Sir Richard Owen would have none of it. I mean, he was the resolute skeptic of his era. He said what McQuay and his shipmen saw was probably a walrus stranded on a block of ice. And they're like, no, what it was was the the greatest difference in in opinions about the creature actually had been those who said it looked more like a serpent or something along those lines. And some said it looked more like a lizard. Uh, Another notable variance was I think Peter McQuay described there being something washed about the back, almost like algae, which he took to be a mane. Others described it as more resembling a fin. 
But they all agreed that there was a large creature that appeared to be essentially reptilian, and the color was brown. It seemed to have a lighter underbelly. That aspect of the description matches one that comes a number of decades later off the coast of South America by the researchers uh, Nichols and Mead Waldo. This is a very well-known uh, account where they were observing off, I believe, the Brazilian coast when they saw at a distance, and they also had spotting scopes, so they were able to get a good look at this thing. Uh, they first noticed a fin break the surface of the water, and that was interesting enough. And then they, turning their scopes in the direction of the fin to try and see what this animal was, they see this head and neck get thrust out of the water. And so at this point, yes, it does seem to sound very much like a plesiosaur or something along those lines, but what they actually note was that the head had a very curious kind of back-and-forth movement as it was going through the water. And the texture and appearance of the skin, yet again, brownish on top with a lighter underbelly uh, on the throat, uh, they said this gave the impression, rather than of a reptile or a snake, of something more like a mammal, hmm. which is interesting. But again, that back and forth might also be interpreted as being a sort of an undulation or an undulation, uh, you know, uh, I don't know if undulative is actually the term, but again, hmm. essentially the creature moving back and forth below the water is, as a means of uh, locomotion as opposed to an up and down kind of a movement hmm. of a tail like a whale would move, for instance. So um, there, are, there are a lot of differing opinions about whether we're talking, if these creatures are all the same thing, whether we're talking about a mammal or something that is more like a reptile. Uh, but again, Marlene Martin, for her own part, she said this thing was a giant snake with alligator teeth. It was 100 feet long. And I don't care if you believe me or not, we all saw it through binoculars. <laughs> <laughs> Quite an account, huh? <laughs> Absolutely. It's incredible. And I think that's, I mean, the, the one thing that often makes me scoff sometimes in regards to um, an explanation that simply doesn't seem to fit the phenomena is is often when we have modern sightings of, of sea creatures that shouldn't exist. People always, certain people will say, oh yeah, well they've seen an oarfish, um, uh, as as if they've no idea that you can find exactly how rare oarfishes are, are sighted. I think I think they've only ever been filmed four times, something ridiculous like that. Yeah, and yet again, very much like the giant squid. We absolutely know that the oarfish exist, but they are a deep ocean fish. We have found their remains washed ashore from time to time. But when I've heard people, when I'm seeing a description of something snake-like, 100 feet long, black, and swimming with its head held aloft mm. off the California coast, I actually have had this happen. When I have shared that story, people will say, well, make, you may or may not be aware, Micah. <laughs> What is known as the oarfish. Let me tell you about the oarfish. And I would like, you know, I mean, again, at that point, face and palm, you know, ensues. And I say, well, let me tell you about the oarfish, okay? First and foremost, that's not a creature that swims on the surface of the water. And they're not often seen swimming at all, uh, let alone under the circumstances that would account for what has been observed in cases like that of Marlene Martin. So, again, I'm more than willing to say that there is a prosaic explanation for sightings like these if you can show me good evidence for it. The problem, however, is, and again, this is not to try and say that these creatures all exist. You know, we live in this fantastic mythical world of, you know, there are griffins and there are dragons. There might as well be, right? Because, heck, Sasquatch and sea serpents exist. Let's just say they're all out there. No, I'm not saying that. I am saying, however, though, that from time to time, the skeptical explanations for claims that are indeed very extraordinary at times, the skeptical interpretations are equally credulous to me in the sense that they do not account for all of the facts, and often they offer angles or solutions that simply could not, could not actually be, given the circumstances in the anecdotal reports. Again, to say something like a you know, an oarfish would meet all of the criteria of a sighting like that of Marlene Martin, I mean, that's frankly a silly proposition. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it does seem to be sometimes that there'll be certain explanations that become a one-size-fits-all that I end up learning more about so-called explanations than, than the usually the phenomenon they're trying to explain away, Micah. <laughs> oh, yes, yes. You know, one of my favorite books, actually, is called The UFO Handbook. And, you know, a name like that, you'd think, oh, we're going to read all about aliens and things like that or whatever. If you are someone who's never read about UFOs, what the book's actually about, it's by Alan Hendry. He's no longer involved in UFO research, but he had been back in the late 1970s under the Center for UFO Studies uh, and actually was directly employed 
under J. Allen Hynek. And what Hendry, uh, and funny thing is, he was a commercial artist. I think he had a bachelor's degree in astronomy. His wife was a Ph.D. astronomy professor. And so she often actually was a consultant for him with the, with the work he was doing at the Center for UFO Studies. But he takes all the data, essentially, that he compiled over a two-year period, and he writes this book called The UFO Handbook. Half of the book is the identification of things that people mistake for UFOs. I mean, literally half of the book. And he's going down the list of what he calls IFOs. He's talking about advertising planes. He's talking about natural phenomena, you know, meteors streaking through the sky, all kinds of stuff. The reason it's such a great book is because he's showing you all the different ways that people with their expectations about things that they may or may not see clearly at night, especially the way that UFO reports are generated from all this. And, you know, a lot of people were really kind of offended by Alan Hendry. They're they're thinking, you know, you don't need to tell us all these things that UFOs might be. No idiot is going to mistake an advertising plane for a UFO. Well, okay, let me give you a, a fantastic report that a friend of mine passed along. He said, Micah, I, I've seen a flying saucer. Uh, it was as vivid as anything I have ever seen. I watched it for like five or ten minutes one night. And uh, the weirdest thing about this flying saucer, he says it was obviously not a plane. I know what aircraft looked like. Again, this is not a helicopter. But he said the weirdest thing about this flying saucer was once or twice, I swear I saw the word Pizza Hut on the side of the thing, <laughs> like in lights being flashed. And I said, listen, you're correct. You weren't looking at the plane, but I don't doubt you were looking at a, again, a, uh, a, a digitally illuminated advertising banner being carried by an advertising plane. And yes, you were seeing an advertisement for Pizza Hut that was not a flying saucer. But again... <laughs> The, that's a fascinating disconnect where the person is not incorrect. They're they're looking at this and saying, I know what I was seeing wasn't a plane. I swear it looked like it said Pizza Hut. Well, that's actually a really good observation, but then layered on top of the observation itself is one's interpretation. And a person prone toward belief in UFOs sees a flying saucer, mm -hmm. even though they can't account for why a flying saucer seemed to be advertising Pizza Hut. Maybe aliens like pizza. I don't know, right? <laughs> I, 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 I don't see why they wouldn't. But, and actually, I should back up there, Paul, because I um my own bias obviously crept in. I said aliens. We don't know what the pilots of the flying saucers may or may not be, so I should abstain from judgment there, too. But again, all joking aside, my point is it's not wrong to offer plausible explanations for certain phenomena. Now, the other half of that book is Hendry actually looking at some good UFO cases and things along those lines. He was not someone who said there are explanations for all UFO sightings. He was a person who said that a good UFO researcher must be aware that the majority of UFO sightings do have prosaic explanations, and if you know what kinds of things to look for, you can help solve some of those cases, especially when someone says they saw Pizza Hut on the side of the flying saucer. <laughs> now, I think the same applies to cryptozoology. There may be a prosaic explanation for what Marlene Martin saw. I think that there are prosaic explanations for a lot of the sightings of the New England sea serpents uh, from the 1700s on up through the 1800s. I definitely think that uh, there are a lot of explanations that are um, more on the nearer side of of uh, you know where skeptics fall with their uh, interpretation of Sasquatch and things along those lines. But as people like Jeffrey Meldrum, again, a scientist who has devoted his career to the study of these creatures and not someone who has, you know, said that reading books about them and studying anecdotal reports is a waste of time like many scientists do know he has done his homework. <laughs> uh, he will tell you, again, yes, the majority of Probably the tracks, the footprint castings and things, at very least a whole lot of them are hoaxes. Yeah, sure. That's a given. In fact, he says, if almost all of them were hoaxes, we still have to recognize that all it would take would be one that is not a hoax. If one of those footprint castings isn't a hoax, then that means all bets are off. There is something worth studying. Yeah. I mean, it is always the perplexing argument that's put forward when people say you know because i've heard pe people clearly and categorically state micah every single footprint is a hoax and i i can remember sanderson once saying you know are you honestly expecting me to believe that someone's going to trek into the middle of nowhere in the dead of winter to to plant some hoaxed footprints on the pure 
million to one chance that a group of people may wander past whilst they're still visible. Well, it's an easy thing for someone who has never gone out there into the middle of nowhere looking for those footprints to say, isn't it? Again, that's that's an uh, again, it, it very well may be that those were hoaxes and that, you know, someone managed to fool Sanderson. Sure. That's absolutely a possibility. I actually, for my own part, based on my analysis of footprint castings that have been made on Vancouver Island over the last couple of decades, I strongly suspect that there are one or two hoaxers on uh, Vancouver Island and that some of the best known uh, footprint castings from that locality uh, probably are the result of some hoaxers, which troubles me hmm. because naturally I would love to think that there are Sasquatches on Vancouver Island. And for God knows, you know, all we know, maybe they are. But I, I think that the similarity between certain castings that I've observed from that island, they're so similar, in fact, and that troubles me about the researchers who've actually noted that similarity but didn't seem to think that they were hoaxes. To me, they look so similar that they couldn't be accounted for under other circumstances. But, again, uh, we see people say things like, you know, if we can make those kinds of assessments, therefore all of the footprints must be hoaxes. I mean, maybe they are, but that seems unlikely, again, based on a complete review of the information about where many of the castings have actually been retrieved. And again, what I hope to do, Paul, in the future, I haven't done it yet, and really with the current coronavirus thing, it may be <laughs> a while before I can, but my hope is to go to the Pacific Northwest. I know of certain collections, some are publicly um, accessible, certain ones are, are not. Um, I know there's an incredible collection of castings that uh, Meldrum himself actually has which he inherited from Grover Krantz. Some of those actually were also taken to the Smithsonian. But I want to go and I want to do a personal study of all of the known uh, collections that I can. And rather than saying they're all hoaxes, I want to look at them and see what I think for myself. Right. But shouldn't we all try that if we can? <laughs> Absolutely. And I think, to be honest, I'm surprised that no one has tried to scientifically catalogue all of them to see if there is, you know, uh, a pattern that develops in the dermal ridging or if they can see a, a particular type of toe structure or or heel implementation. It it once again comes back to the stigma of, of putting this under rigorous scientific examination. Well, yes, and again, we seem to have an awful lot of data for there to be no physical evidence for Sasquatch, even as Peter Byrne said to me, and maybe he said to you when you spoke with him too, mm -hmm. but again, for there to be so little physical evidence, I mean, I'm not going to dispute that. Again, science doesn't seem to think, that the majority of them at least, that Sasquatch exists. I get it. Okay, but I do think that there's an awful lot of data. I do think that there's an awful lot of information that has been collected that really – should be looked at a little more closely before we rule out of hand the possibility that a creature like this could exist. We should take all of those footprint castings. We should take all of this data, do exactly what you're talking about, a serious comprehensive study with all of the technology that we have at our disposal today. What might that tell us? Are we prepared for the possibility that if we actually invest the time, the dollars, the manpower, the energy, the effort, are we prepared for the possibility that rather than what we have already expected, the foregone conclusion that you're not going to find anything, this is all a hoax, are we prepared for the possibility that there could be a giant anthropoid ape in North America that we have not yet recognized and yet has existed beneath our noses for as long as we've been here or perhaps longer? Yeah. I mean, yeah. The, I mean the thing about it is as well, Micah, I mean, I, I'm one of those people that I'm, I, I'd like to think that I'm, I'm balanced enough and, and rational. And like, I, like you've said uh, a couple of times i have that internal struggle with the lack of physical evidence compared to the the vast majority of castings and eyewitness reports and vocalizations and things like that that people have reported as as proof so for me it's it's always i tend to look at it and there's no disrespect to anybody that, that that's claimed to have a, a first-hand experience, but I, I dismiss the vast majority as misidentification, hallucination, um, or outright hoaxing. Um, but that once again, like you say in regards to the footprints, even if one of these stories is true, then it, that's a whole different kettle of fish. It is a whole different kettle of fish, and that's one of my favorite expressions too. <laughs> and you know, again, one one of the issues I see with with all of this is, again, I think that not only is there an aversion, uh, we, for instance, again, I don't make any comparisons, by the way, between Sasquatch and UFOs. I mean, every now and then, you know, you'll do an interview and people will be like, what about all the sightings of 
Bigfoot, you know, scene coming out of flying saucers and things. And I'm like, well, let's take about out of that question and just leave it at what sightings. I mean, sure, there have been people who have claimed to have seen Sasquatch in close proximity to where UFOs have also been seen. But what about all those sightings? Well, there aren't all that many. There really aren't. And even if you review the literature and you find a few, there aren't all that many. And then if you take into consideration fanciful attitudes about things, myths, delusions, hoaxes, you know, personal fantasies, all of the different levels of psychological reasons that these sorts of perceived phenomena might coexist. Again, you know, I have very similar issues uh, with the so-called paranormal Sasquatch crowd. And, you know, there may be some listeners who uh, endorse that idea. Again, no disrespect to any of them. No disrespect to those who think hairy hominids are jumping off of flying saucers. The point I'm making, though, is that, again, when we begin to equate those kinds of phenomena, you know, and say that they are similar to one another or may have some kind of rela you know, relationship, superficial though that relationship may be, we potentially do more harm than good in the sense that many who can't put a finger on what Sasquatch is say, OK, well, then it must be paranormal. You know, these here's why these creatures are paranormal. Uh, my good friend Nick Redford and I, we argue about this sometimes. And again, we're also still really good pals. You know, I don't I don't disrespect him for having his own opinions about these things. And that's where logic has taken him. But now I differ and he knows this for my own part. If we can't define what paranormal is. And what that means if we say Sasquatch is paranormal, we have no we have done no better offering an explanation for the Sasquatch enigma by saying they are paranormal than saying that these are actual physical flesh and blood anthropoid apes. Hmm. Same thing with saying that they come from flying saucers. If we try to say that, well, the reason we don't find bodies, the reason we can't find Sasquatch camps and things like that is because they drop down on UFOs whenever we want to, you know, whenever they want to come down to Earth. That is not using a, a probable a probable basis for explaining explaining an already improbable phenomenon. That is attaching it to another, again, per, presumably improbable or at very least an unexplained phenomenon. You don't get you know, a positive by smashing together two negatives. And when it comes to the unexplained, if I take two unexplained and put them together, that doesn't equate to a solution. So those who make those kinds of claims, you know, Sasquatch is paranormal, Sasquatch is an alien, those are not explanations. Those are just suppositions piled on top of suppositions. We have to look at, okay, we've got an apparent phenomenon here. How can we best account for it? Now, like you said, I agree that probably the majority of what we're looking at with data is actually bad information. I mean, there are a lot of hoaxes. There are a lot of misperceptions. That's the really troubling side of all this. We will never really have good data as long as humans are involved. And... <laughs> And I would say that a lot of people, if they've read my articles on Sasquatch and writings, I probably come across sounding a lot more skeptical. When I'm on the microphone, people probably think I'm like the world's biggest advocate. What's with the disconnect? Well, it is because I am willing to challenge attitudes. And when I'm doing an interview, I guess I'm more often asked about, you know, what is the good evidence and you know, why do you disagree with the skeptics? But when I write about Sasquatch, often I'm writing with a fair amount of skepticism, and I actually address a lot of preconceptions that even the believers have. Getting the human component out of it, Paul, that's one of the issues. We'll never really do that. Until we have AI that can help us look for Sasquatch, we're always going to have to deal with hoaxes, misperceptions, you know, personal fantasies, delusions, all kinds of stuff. But there is always still that other possibility, that there is some tangible real phenomena worthy of scientific study. And until we have AI to help us, which may or may not be a good thing. <laughs> All we have to rely on, really, is the scientific method. No, because I was going to say, because it's it's also frustrating as well, because there often seems to be this theory that uh, cryptozoology is, is the only, uh, you know, I'll call it a scientific endeavour, that is prone to hoaxing. Yet, you know, as, as someone with your vast interest in archaeology, Micah, that alone, there are countless examples of archaeology being faked to prove certain things exist from Noah's Ark to Troy to to you know every continent in the world's had a great archaeological scandal so why why does why does it seem that only the hoaxing in cryptozoology tends to stick more yeah that's a really good point you know one of the things i think i find most interesting about archaeology and i've become interested in and actually very involved in archaeological research in the last a few years here and uh, i've had the unique privilege of not only being able to work alongside some of the what i take to be some of the best 
American archaeologists that are working right now and doing field work. Uh, but I've also had the extremely unique privilege of interviewing some of the most respected archaeologists, um, including uh, Dr. Andrew Moore, uh, who is a honorary um, president of the a past president of the Archaeological Institute of America. And so um, I think a lot of people, when they hear I'm interested in archaeology, I've actually had people say this, you know, my friends who follow my interest in the unexplained skeptical, though I am at times, I've said, you know, I'm going to be out of town next week doing archaeology. And they'll be like, oh, when do you get back from hunting Bigfoot? You know, <laughs> I I draw a distinction, you know, and, and shout out to my man, uh, Brett Tingley, by the way, writer for the War Zone. He, a fantastic guy, a good friend of mine, lives right here in western North Carolina. <laughs> he was the very one who said that. And, uh, of course, I, I, I love that joke, you know. He knows my serious interest in Sasquatch, too. But uh, Brett, who also has a background in uh, cultural anthropology himself. He also knows my serious interest in archaeology. I draw lines, uh, you know, between them. My interest in archaeology, I definitely think there should be more anthropological and serious archaeological interest in something like Sasquatch. But when I'm going and I'm doing archaeology, no, it's not ancient aliens. No, it's not lost civilizations and stuff like that. I mean, it's real archaeology. And I treat that discipline just like I would expect to treat any other scientific discipline. And I try to bring the same caution, care, and seriousness to it that I would, whether it's physics, biology, whatever else. But, you know, like you kind of said there with regard to cryptozoology, you know, if it is a science or if it is to become a science, you know, it must be treated that way too. Mm -hmm. And like you point out, we cannot presume that something like cryptozoology, incomplete though the science of cryptozoology may be, uh, really, at some point, I think cryptozoology really just becomes zoology. Mm. True. But you're right. I mean, yeah, you look at something like archaeology, and it is as rife with hoaxes and weirdness as, as anything else. And really, many scientific disciplines do. I mean, if you look at all of the quackery that appears in, in the medical sciences and that people are always warning about, you know, people's, you know, crazy cures and, you know, misconceptions and things. Again, there is a tremendous effort to try and combat a lot of that right now with the current coronavirus pandemic. Uh, people are very concerned about uh, myths, conspiracies, presumptions, you know, bad information that's being circulated on social media, all these kind of things. Every area of the sciences is potentially prone to bad information, to hoaxes, to misinterpretation, to biases, whether those biases come from the believers or the skeptics. You know, it happens in climate science. It happens in archaeology. It happens everywhere. It happens in medicine. So, again, to say that cryptozoology is necessarily any different, you make a great point. And I know that absolutely from from experience working in archaeology. When I got into doing archaeology, Paul, I, uh, I really thought, well, this is going to be a great opportunity for me to get involved in a scientific discipline where there won't be infighting differences of opinion, <laughs> ideas, hoaxes, you know, <laughs> ad hominem attacks. Yeah, right. It's it's worse than the UFO field is on Twitter at times, depending on what day of the week. So, I mean, yeah, again, we will never get past those things until we get humans out of the equation. And I'm not saying get humans out of the equation. I'm saying recognize the human potentials and the human flaws that lead to these sorts of problems. Absolutely. I think the problem it, it is as well is that for some it becomes they are so convinced of what they have, even if it's just a tantalizing morsel that may or may not be actual proof of, of whatever discipline it is, Micah. For some of them, they just, they can't contain themselves. They have to prove it by by some way or other, you know, and, the, and I try not to mention people, especially in the, in the field of crypto as well as you, who are well known um, or, or alleged to be um, hoaxes and, and quite a few have, have become infamous, I, th I suggest. But um, it's it's difficult for me because I know I'm not a massive expert in archaeology it's it's something i've often i've followed since i was a child so you know all, all you have to look at is the piltdown man as a as a prime example of a of a massive hoax that ended up becoming more of a uh, a question of the ethics of the people involved in it and and everybody prepared to just ignore it oh yes yes there's the piltdown man again that's a really interesting one because here what we seem to have is an ideologically driven – I mean, there were a, a group of well-known scholars that were involved with that entire affair, and there was this – this. I mean, again, the, we still are trying to figure out 
although we obviously know it was a hoax and we know most of the key players that were involved and who we actually think the mastermind was at this point. We're still sort of trying to figure out with Piltdown. Uh, in fact, actually, uh, one time, uh, Taylor Hard Day Chardin was even uh, sort of implicated because he had been involved with the key players at that time. But uh, the the question seems to now be one of, you know, what was the aim? What was the goal, essentially, of trying to to present uh, a fraudulent uh, mishmash of of you know primate um, features uh, as evidence of something? Uh, newly discovered in the fossil record, which is found later not to be that at all. You know, what 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 is it that drives someone to want to steer the narrative in that way? If I can't find actual evidence for my theory, then I'm going to a fake it so that people will think I'm right, or b present something that is fraudulent but good enough looking that I can mislead everybody else who differs with me. I mean, you see very simple. Very interesting corollaries in um, particularly the uh, late 19th century here in America, you know, when the and the early 20th century, um, when the Smithsonian Institute was first uh, you know, on the scene, there had been a rival um, antiquarian group, I guess was the term of the day. Hmm. Uh, they were known as the Davenport Society. And the Davenport Society had many members who were um, staunch believers in the idea that the mound building cultures that we associate with the Hopewell you know, the Mississippi and the Adena culture in North American archaeology. Hmm. There had been a long held contention among many of those uh, 19th century antiquarians that, you know, these mound building cultures had not been the Native Americans that, again, Europeans come and rob uh, the Americas from. We're going to come over and, uh, you know, we're just going to build a little encampment. And in a few decades, we've taken all your land and, you know, all these horrible things happen, uh, which many indigenous Americans are still to this day uh, struggling with as a result of. And, so, you know, there had been this unfortunate attitude among some of the antiquarians that, well, we don't believe that this land belonged to the indigenous Americans, that they were the first ones here. We want to try and find evidence that the mound building cultures had been Europeans who got here somehow before they did. And so what you see happening was the creation of tablets and all kinds of other funny artifacts that were sometimes planted in burial mounds. And it seemed to have been with the intent of misleading the public into thinking that we had found evidence of arrival in ancient times of Europeans in the New World. Now, the problem is there are some uh, curious little tablets and other artifacts that do actually suggest um, diffusion and, and, and different kinds of connectivity between different cultures in the ancient world that are very tantalizing. But when you start having hoaxes, OK, that appear in the mix and you start seeing what ideological things are driving those hoaxes and the unfortunate reasons for that. Right. Then we begin to say, well, and this is a general attitude of, among most skeptics in archaeology. They would say we probably are best off if we rule out all of these, you know, out of place artifacts as being hoaxes, because if one or two of them were, we probably can guess that the others were as well. But what if? And I know that's a controversial question, especially among my colleagues in archaeology. But what if some of these things are not uh, the hoaxes that we presume that they are? Mm-hmm. I mean, it would tell an incredible story about the ancient past. And I think that, you know, if we are cautious, if we are sensitive to people's belief systems, cultures, values, etc., and also the reasons why some people would try and rob other cultures like the indigenous Americans of aspects of their history in that way, If we are responsible and we are fully aware of all of those issues and we proceed with caution, it is not wrong to look at the possibility that there are certain quote unquote archaeological anomalies. We've just got to be careful with them. My point is that, yes, in archaeology, we see this incredible kind of mishmash of issues that must be taken into consideration. And every time you've got another hoax, it absolutely muddies the water. And so when you look at something like cryptozoology, where, I mean, the sum total of it is taken by most in science as, you know, just being a hoax. Again, yeah, I I totally, from the archaeological perspective, see why that's so problematic. One or two hoaxes, and then the entire thing is completely just stained. And that really is problematic. Yeah, it it does seem to be very infectious as well. And, and, you know, there's been numerous incidents especially in the birth of social media micah and and youtube more than anything with you know 
because there's a monetization factor at play here as well, especially in this day and age, you can you can stick any old video on YouTube, and if you you know you get to a certain point, you start raking it in. Oh yeah! Again, look at all the kids with their YouTube channels, where every week they've got fantastic UFO footage. <laughs> yeah, uh huh. Really, every week you guys have got just this incredible stuff. I mean, seriously, if videos of UFOs that were of that quality were really being made that often, there would be no question any longer about there being unidentified flying objects. We may still wonder what they are, but there we would there would be a consensus at this point. If they appeared that frequently and if that many people were able to film them that reliably, there would no longer be a question about whether these un unidentified flying objects exist. Then you look at, for instance, again, in this era of viral videos and things like that, then you look at something like Sasquatch. You know, look at the different – this is a fascinating thing, too, because I've got a lot of friends in the hunting industry and in the outdoors industry, and sportsmen, you know, and camouflage and things like that. Good people to know if you're interested in Sasquatch, plain and simple, okay? And – they are fascinated, as I am, about the number of people who are sportsmen, hikers, hunters, you know, um, uh, campers who go out and they film Sasquatch. OK, now, most of the videos, it's obvious that it's a hoax, that it's somebody in a shaggy monkey suit and it doesn't even begin to look good. But there are some well-known uh, archers and campers, outdoor enthusiasts who seem to endorse these videos as though they are real. And some of them have actually made the videos themselves, which is really weird. And it gets into this realm of, wow, why would a otherwise, you know, serious outdoorsman or, you know, hiker or something, you know, long distance trail run or whatever, why would they seemingly fake a Sasquatch video? And see, this is a whole other side of this phenomenon that I don't think many people address, Paul. Mm. For them, I think just like the very skeptical scientists, they presume, they lead with the presumption that Sasquatch is just a joke and that everyone essentially agrees with that perspective. And so when they fake a Bigfoot video, they aren't doing it with any malice, I don't think. I think what they're doing is they're doing, they're just trying to play into this joke, into this sort of modern mythology. And for them, it's fun and they see no harm in that. They would never really think that there are serious researchers, people who, like you and I, are arguing, hey, you know, we're going to keep this at arm's length. We're going to be skeptical, but we're also open minded. But we want to study it seriously. I don't think those people I don't think it ever crosses their mind that there are people like us who really take the subject seriously. And for them, it's just fun. They don't think Sasquatch is anything more than fun. And therefore, I think as far as well, why would somebody hoax a video like that? I think a lot of these people. In addition to the monetary side of it, like you're talking about, the fact that, hey, if I get a lot of followers and a lot of views on my YouTube video, I can actually make money doing this. That's one side of it. But I also think some people do it because they think, they presume, in fact, that there's nothing more to this than a joke. And therefore, if they play into the joke, too, it's fun. It's harmless. They certainly don't think they're offending serious Sasquatch researchers. They don't really think there are any. Mm. Yeah, well, maybe it's a, it's a lack of knowledge in the subject, and all they read is the you know the the pop culture version of the of the phenomenon, Micah. Precisely, I think that's precisely what it is. And and it's interesting as well in regards to that uh, that when you speak to to people who have a certain slant on the phenomenon, as far as they're concerned, Bigfoot began in 1958. Um, but I find that troubling on two. Um, points because first of all that completely disregards the entire Native American traditions and and stoke lot stories and f folklore as they've become allegedly but they mm -hmm. have a, uh, a a record of of these creatures going back aeons so you've got that aspect that you're ignoring and you're also ignoring the newspaper reports um, there was a marvelous book came out towards the end of the last year by uh, a gentleman called Adam Benedict called Monsters in Print um, and he uh, collected a, a wonderful collection of old news stories of weird cryptids from around America and there were numerous stories of people encountering wild men hairy wild men up and down especially in California Yes, in fact, um, although I use it for more than this, I, I have a number of <laughs> subscriptions to newspaper accounts like, uh, in fact, uh, new, newspapers.com is one that I use, but there's also Chronicling America that's made of, available online for free mm. through the Library of Congress. I also subscribe to the New York Times. Um, and the number one reason that I uh, subscribed to a number of newspaper services like this is exactly for what you're talking about. 
a number of researchers, whether it's in UFOs, whether it's in cryptozoology, whether you're just interested in history like me and you're doing historical research completely unrelated to anything weird. Um, you know, these newspaper uh, online services are fantastic. I mean, they're they're so fun. And I uh, I enjoy being able to pour through these old newspapers and read these accounts. But, yeah, the, the number one reason that I actually uh, – actually signed up and got these subscriptions was because at the time I was looking for early wild man reports. And you're absolutely right. And I'm going to have to check out Adam Benedict's uh, uh, book there because I'm very interested in the research that others have found as well. Um, I think, um, let's see here. Uh, what's his name? Uh, oh gosh. No, I'm, I'm drawing a blank on his name, but the book is called historical Bigfoot. Do you recall yes. the name? Oh, I know exactly who you're talking about as well. How Mint, frustrating. Uh, yeah, his name's. Uh, I think it's. I think I want to say it's Chad or Chuck Arment, and I really apologize. I'm usually better yeah, on the draw. Is, is it Chad Arnett? That rings I, a bell. I believe so. And again, my apologies to the listenership if, if, uh, if I've, if uh, you know, my my memory at the moment is is slightly uh, less than than ideal. I'm I'm admittedly right now uh, putting a lot of uh, resources, uh, uh, you know, mental and otherwise, toward <laughs> study of this uh, developing coronavirus situation, which has been a whole other kettle of fish. It's been enough to distract anybody. But uh, I think Chad Arment, I, I believe, is the title or the name. And the book is called Historical Bigfoot. But essentially, he did the same thing. Mm. He went through, he diligently documented reports from newspapers and periodicals and other publications that give descriptions of these creatures. Now, listen, I don't know how we're doing on time, but I've got a really important point I need to make here. Mm -hmm. This is, um, and if you're good for time, I'm good for time. You know, Absolutely. I'm, I'm, Carry on, sir. I'm enjoying the conversation. So um, there is that book. It's a good book. Uh, I definitely uh, enjoyed reading it, uh, and I think more Bigfoot uh, enthusiasts and cryptozoological researchers should Probably read this book too. It's called Abominable Science um, by uh, Donald uh, Prothero and Daniel Loxton. Um, I say read it because it is a necessary skeptical perspective on a number of popular cryptozoological tropes, for lack of a better term. They cover Loch Ness Monster, Bigfoot, the Abominable Snowman. There's some really great points made in that book. Now, where I absolutely differ and this is with with full respect to the authors, uh, neither of whom I have you know corresponded with. So I'm not calling them out here. I'm actually praising uh, their skeptical efforts as researchers because that provides a necessary counterbalance in this conversation. Mm. But in the Sasquatch chapter, uh, I was pretty unimpressed with some of the assertions made. They say that essentially, one, the Sasquatch as we know it, resembling a large hairy ape, doesn't appear on the cultural landscape until 1955. Uh, they say anything before that was unequivocally simply descriptions of large Indians. <laughs> and and, and the, the general idea was what they draw from was there are, yes, there were some legends in the indigenous groups in particularly, uh, particularly the Northwest, the Pacific Northwest. There were certain traditions that did involve large you know, again, what, for lack of a better term, would be called large Indians. But they try to say in the book that not only are all pre-1955 reports of Sasquatch essentially that, but also that John Green essentially conceded that point as well, and that we can make a firm, clear argument, a demonstrable case that Sasquatch, as we know it today, Bigfoot, the large ape creature, doesn't appear until 1955. Mm. Well, or thereabouts. Now, that's absolutely wrong. Again, if we go back to the 1920s, when J.W. Burns was publishing in McLean's magazine, remember introducing British Columbia's big hairy apes, right? Uh, or big hairy giants, I think, yeah. actually, is the term he used. He didn't say apes. It was big hairy giants. But that uh, McLean's magazine out of Canada makes that article available for free for reading online. In the article, which I believe, did it date to 1928, I believe? Um, I should actually double check on that in a moment. But uh, this article written by J.W. Burns, again, he was an educator on, I believe it was the Che Hallis Indian Reservation. And he had begun to collect stories from people there on the reservation about these, you know, again, what he actually introduces the name for as Sasquatch. Mm -hmm. But they had a number of different names. He kind of creates this combination of, of different terms. So yet again, we've got a, an instance where a writer in popular media creates a nickname by which these creatures are best known. Same thing happens decades later with Bigfoot, 
Same thing happens in 1947 with flying saucers, although it's also been shown by diligent newspaper historians that flying saucer, that expression had been used well in advance of Kenneth Arnold in 1947. Mm. So a bit of a bit of a you know sidestep there. But coming back to J.W. Burns, there's a very interesting account that he gives in that original article from a Mr. William Point. And William Point, one of the uh, one of the actual members of one of the local tribes there in the Pacific Northwest, probably around the Harrison Lake area, if memory serves. William Point and I believe his girlfriend at the time had been uh, walking down a railroad track when they see a large uh, figure in the distance coming down the railroad track toward them. Hmm. As it gets closer, it becomes evident to them that they, th- this was not a creature. So, or rather, that I'm sorry, that this was not a person. This was a creature. This was not a human. <laughs> now, what uh, what William Point, he actually writes a letter to J.W. Burns, which Burns features verbatim in the context of the article. Hmm. And what's, oh, well, actually, I'll come back around to the skeptical interpretation of this article here in a moment, which really, really is baffling. William Point gives the following description of the figure. He says, as it comes close to us, he said it was larger than a man. Uh, he estimates it being at about 10 feet tall. He says the arms were so long that they hang, hung down nearly to the knees, perhaps even longer. He said it was covered all about the body and hair like the bears are. He said that it's stooped over as it walked. He says its nose was so broad that it covered nearly half of its face and that the mouth was just a long, wide crease covering almost the entire width of the face with no lips visible. He said it was very frightening. His girlfriend runs from this creature. He grabs stones ready to throw them at it as they're about to retreat. And he says that the thing stops a good distance away from him, and then, then it takes off up into the woods and leaves the railroad track. But he essentially describes a creature that's 10 feet tall with a, a wide, flat nose, a thin but long mouth, long arms, covered in hair, he says, as the bears are. Now, that sounds to me like a pretty good description of even what we would call Sasquatch modern times, right? Yeah. The authors of the book in question, Abominable Science, on the other hand, they say, well, again, when they refer to these creatures as being hairy, they're talking about hair on the head, okay, (laughs) not hair on the body. Well, again, they actually reference another report that Burns featured in his actual uh, article there. They refer to the uh, testimony of a man named Charlie Victor who claimed that he met a Sasquatch woman. Um, in the mountains and that she had actually spoken to him in what was known as the Douglas dialect, a variety of an older dialect, uh, but a regional dialect nonetheless that he could understand. Now, that's interesting, uh, a very interesting story, mm. but this was part of the basis for which the authors say, look, these things, when they were referring to Sasquatch, they unequivocally meant large Indians. These are folkloric giant Indians in their belief system. And actually, if you read the account not only is that not necessarily the case, because at one point Charlie Victor described how she reaches down with a hairy arm and picks up a human child in the in the actual description of that encounter. Mm-hmm. So they refer to at least the arm as being hairy. Mm-hmm. But furthermore, while they're saying that there's a clear case that he, Charlie Victor, the witness, claimed to have only seen a giant woman, they completely dismiss or don't even acknowledge William Point's testimony quoted verbatim in that article where he describes hair all over the body just like a bear. <laughs> so, so, again, that's not the only instance. 1924, okay, Ape Canyon. There mm-hmm. were articles that appeared in the Seattle Times that described the hairy ape men of Mount St. Helens. Yeah. And so, I mean, it's remarkable to me that we have books that are published that can cherry pick. And I think it is fair with respect to the authors to say in this instance that there was a fair amount of cherry picking. They picked the details and the accounts that conformed to the narrative that they were trying to present, but they were unfairly dismissive of, or perhaps ignorant of others that clearly refuted their hypothesis that there were no accounts of anything resembling a large ape or ape-like human prior to 1955. That's simply not the case. In fact, the contrary is shown in some of the very same resources they cite in their book. Yeah, I mean, it's incredible. I mean, I can think of of, of one excellent case, simply off the top of my head, Michael, which was um, from Cobalt, which was a town in Ontario, Canada. Um, And they had a numerous reports. I think they were uh, lumbermen, lumberjacks out there. Mm. 
and there were numerous reports of encounters with some large hairy creature on the edge of the tree line keeping its eye on them. Um, and these stories consisted to be reported over the next 50 years. Right. And there's the one from California that uh, I know that uh, Bender, Bender Noggle wrote about it, and mm. also Meldrum uh, had featured this one. I, I don't have the, the details right on hand, but I know that in, uh, in Jeffrey Meldrum's book, Legend Meets Science, Sasquatch Legend Meets Science, uh, this account is featured, I believe, in the second chapter of the book, if memory serves. Mm. And it entails a prospector who had been out in the California wilderness, and he said that he'd come back to his campfire at night and find the ashes had been moved about and stirred. And he never saw any footprints because of the hard-packed clay there at the campsite. But he says one night he hid, and he waited, and he watched. And suddenly he says that this man-like creature comes out of the brush. Now, it's only five feet tall by his estimate. Hmm. Uh, but he says that its you know, shoulders were almost as broad as the thing was tall. Hmm. From the looks of it, it was just huge. He said the arms were very long, that they went all the way down almost to the knees. It was covered in hair and that the head was small in relation to the rest of the body, and that there appeared to be no neck. Again, Bender Noggle also referenced this one in his books, like uh, the uh, discovery of the Sasquatch. Hmm. Again, I can't think of a better description apart from the fact that it's a little small at five feet, according to, or at least, you know, compared with other reports gathered over the centuries, like hmm. you point out, again, taking into consideration with complete respect to the indigenous Americans, and that's another thing that just, you know, ticks me off. Yeah. The utter dismissal of indigenous cultures, their belief systems, their values, their traditions, you know, that to me is terrible. On the one hand, we say we don't we don't allow for things like cultural appropriation. And we all on the one hand say that, you know, it's terrible for us to, to steal and rob indigenous Americans of their history and their culture. And then on the other hand, when it's something that's just too far out for our liking, we're more than happy to rule those things out of hand and completely dismiss their beliefs, their values, their history. Yes. It, Atrocious. It is absolutely atrocious. It is because I think one of the other uh, famous um, native legends and, and stories is oh, I'm trying to remember that the, there's a cave in Nevada, Micah. Lovelock Cave. Which is essentially it's it's blackened with soot, and the story is that they trapped a race of, of giants who were cannibals because they were sick of them attacking the tribes, I believe, and burnt them out, or, or essentially burnt them to death. And nobody believed this story until somebody eventually went to see it and could not believe that it was true. There was this cave that was black on the inside. Yeah, Lovelock Cave, Nevada. That's a, a very interesting story. Um, and in fact, uh, my good friend David Weatherly was here in town last fall. Mm. Back when you could still you know, safely travel around and everything, he and his wife came down. And we talked a lot about that because there are a lot of very interesting um, anthropological writings on that cave that many are not aware of. Of course, uh, I think Sarah Winnemucca and her account from her ancestors is one of the best ones. But there was also a really interesting paper that was published by, I think it was the Nevada Archaeological Society, maybe back in the 1970s. Uh, they published an article titled uh, something along the lines of John Reed and the Search for uh, the Red-Headed Giants of Nevada or something along those lines. I've got a copy of it in my files, but mm. It provides some very interesting anthropological considerations uh, in addition to other stories from that region and other collected traditions from those native groups, which to me don't really necessarily point to anything like Sasquatch, but they are very suggestive of perhaps an early uh, meeting and perhaps not an entirely a friendly one between cultures. But I mean, let's just say that that's a whole other rabbit hole we could go down, but in the, in the, in the, scope of what you're talking about yes because this seems to fall outside of conventional modern attitudes anthropologically or otherwise it's like we get to pick and choose the things that we choose to allow indigenous cultures to have and to believe mm. it's just absurd again i think that and especially sasquatch is maybe one of the best cases when i when i refer to that seattle times article from 1924 which explicitly refers to ape-like features of these creatures in relation to the famous alleged ape canyon incident yep. they actually interview a indigenous american leader by the name of yost tagley in that article mm -hmm. and he says in the article you know often we the uh, indigenous residents have learned not to talk about these things because the white man he's using the parlance of the day of course mm -hmm. white man often tells us that we're liars yeah. they don't believe us 
Yeah, nobody believed the, the stories of the mountain devils, I believe they call them. Right, yeah, and again, yet yet again, in fact, there is an existing cultural tradition, hmm. and, and this troubles me so badly because, again, here, yes, I get it, those are quote-unquote legends, but in many parts of the world, there are legends which have, again, this is a fundamental tenet of mythology, events, observations, and things especially in 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 cultures where uh, written language or or perhaps in cultures that predated written language mythology is born out of observations of nature and and events that occur and stories that are passed down in oral histories so that those events aren't forgotten but with time they are tied into the cycles of nature and things like this and they are yes mythologized and they help again what mythology helps us do is remember things from ancient times hmm. and to and, and fundamental observations about nature in ways that can be easily remembered. And again, when you put a pattern to them, when you have a plot line, a story, you know, yes, a lot of myths and legends are simply that myths and legends that amp anthropomorphize things observed in nature and things along those lines, but they serve a purpose and there are truths underlying those mythologies. That's the fundamental takeaway that has to be taken into consideration. A great example of this is the book Hamlet's Mill by Ertha von Deckend and um, Giorgio de Santillana. They were uh, looking at, again, this this incredible, uh, very wide-reaching survey of ancient mythology, and their big takeaway is that th these mythologies essentially indicate observations of celestial mechanics by ancient people who were apparently aware of properties of precession, essentially the torque of the spin of the earth and the way that the stars moved in relation to that, and that these sorts of ideas were encoded into stories that were anthropomorphized and mythologized, okay, mm. so that those kinds of things could be remembered. But over time, although the fundamental legends are definitely passed down and we still have many of them today, uh, the meaning of some of those mythologies and those legends have been lost to time. My point, again, is that those myths and legends, myths though they may be, often have a, an air of truth to them. And the ubiquitousness, again, Sanderson and many others have written about this for decades, the ubiquitousness of the wild man archetype, the idea of this other that is some sort of feral or primal, sort of similar to us or aspect of ourselves that exists on the fringe of civilization, that is something that we find in most, not all perhaps, but most cultures around the world. The problem with the myth interpretation is that if we look at all of these early accounts as being purely myths, but in modern times we still have what appear to be very tangible recollections of physical phenomena observed that correlate with those myths. I don't know about you, Paul, but for my own part, that causes me to say, okay, how, how much of this stuff is all really purely myth? Mm -hmm. When I'm seeing... You know, William Point's description from the 1920s of this thing that he says that he encountered, you know, I'm looking at that and I'm saying, this doesn't sound like a, a myth or a legend or folklore to me. He's saying this is what I saw and it scared the hell out of me. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think the other aspect of that is that the, the people just didn't have the connectivity and these stories came from all across the North America. So the potential of, of people traveling thousands of miles to pass on uh, a folk tale also pushes the bounds of, of credulity in regards to we're expecting people in northern Canada to, to be able to pass the story down to people who live in northern California. Yeah, I mean, maybe it's not impossible, but again, like you're saying, it seems unlikely that that alone would account for the uh, the tremendous diversity and the regional uh, consistency of these legends. Um, there is a really, really great article that the old Info uh, Journal, which that's the International Fortean Organization, uh, they published an article, which I don't know if it's available online any place, but if, if those out there listening in the uh, listening audience are followers of the late William R. Corliss, the anomalist extraordinaire, and if you're not, you should be, uh, he wrote a book called Incredible Life, uh, which was one of the many um, collections of catalogs of quick entries on scientific anomalies, and he did collections that were in the biological sciences. He did entire collections on astronomy, entire collections on archaeology, which are some of my favorites, but I love them all. Mm. Um, in his biological writings, uh, I think I think Incredible Life was maybe more than 900 pages. It was tremendous. But he features this article from the old in, uh, International Fortean Organization newsletter 
And it had been by the great Lauren Coleman and the late uh, Mark A. Hall. I had the pleasure of meeting Mark Hall uh, before he passed away a number of years ago. I was maybe 20, 21 years old, and Lauren was actually there at that event. And uh, Lauren and Mark wrote a lot of things together over the years, but that article that they wrote is this comprehensive I mean, it's not it's not exhaustive, but I mean, it is one of the best articles in my in in my opinion that surveys Native American beliefs and traditions in relation to Sasquatch. And uh, again, you can find Incredible Life. Um, I think there maybe still are copies available online. I've seen some digital copies hmm. in circulation too. I'd really love for someone to reprint all of Corliss's book and keep uh, books and keep them in print, the Source Book Project. But Anyway, that that uh, article by Lauren Coleman and Mark A. Hall is remarkable. And again, the the incredible consistency, coming back to your point, of the accounts of these creatures in different North American groups and in their mythologies and traditions, it is just remarkable. But that article really just put into perspective perspective for me uh, exactly what you're talking about. This is something that was so widespread just in America alone. And then you apply that to the rest of the world where you have similar instances – of, of remarkable, consistent, you know, recollections of these accounts with these human-like creatures on the fringes of society. It's just fascinating. Absolutely. I think the key aspect that we, we can take from this fabulous conversation, thank you for your time today, um, oh, is, is essentially that we just need to keep remembering what, the, what evidence is there before us and, and utilise the information we have at our fingertips from the variety of cultural sources, be it archaeological or, or tales of myth and legend that are interwoven with other factually based um, evidence from that period. And, and use it to push the boundaries of what we want in regards to definitive proof of, of this wonderful creature. Yeah, that's such a good point you make, because often I think people are like, show me the body. You know, let's get out there and let's find the evidence. And something you said really strikes home. There is so much information in this digital era that we can access online. Some of you got to pay for. That's the truth. You ain't going to get everything for free. Right. In the words of Frederick Hayek, there ain't no such thing as a free lunch. But, you know, as diligent researchers, the first place we need to begin, begin looking again. And I know this from my study of all the natural sciences. More discoveries have been found They've been logged, they've been stuffed away on a shelf or in a drawer in a museum, and they aren't actually recognized as being anything unique until sometimes decades later. Hmm. We need to work with all of the information that we already have on hand, and even if we don't have access to you know, those drawers or those shelves in you know, these different museums or institutions, there is a lot of data, a lot of information that can be easily accessed online by anybody if they're willing to do the research. Let's start right there. Let's start with that plethora of data and that information and see what we can draw from that. You know, and of course, yes, always, let's get out there and let's get on the track. Let's keep looking for other additional information and of course that long sought physical proof. But you know, we shouldn't think of that as being the only way that this mystery uh, we may not solve it without a body, let's say, but there are certainly ways we can learn about this phenomena and these subjects with what information we have on hand. You're absolutely right. Absolutely. Well, listen, Micah, it's been an absolute pleasure to um, have you stretch my, my test my knowledge as much as you have this evening. <laughs> well, it's very impressive. Again, I love being able to talk with someone who's as well read as you are, Paul. And somebody who, uh, you know, appreciates these subjects. And, uh, you know, again, it's my pleasure to do this. I hope we will do it again sometime soon as well. Oh, well, my, the pleasure. The door is always open, sir. You are always welcome. So, um, Micah, where can everybody keep up to date with you and, and follow your wonderful show? Uh, yes, it's all available at MicahHanks.com. I've consolidated, although I do still have my long-running Grayley Interport website. Uh, but if you want to be able to find everything that I do, all the links to all the shows and everything can just be found right there at micahanks.com. And you can definitely download those podcasts for free at micahanks.com forward slash podcast. Fantastic. And you also write regularly for Mysterious Universe still, because I, I read one of your most recent articles on the historical Orang Pendek. That's indeed true. Yes. You know, Ben and uh, Aaron are good friends of mine, have been for a long time. Thank goodness. You know, Ben wrote to me yesterday morning, in fact, and uh, 
Uh, we hadn't been in touch in a while. I don't think we actually spoke on the mic, so to speak, in, since before the last U.S. election in 2016. But Ben, uh, you know, in these trying times, uh, he wrote to tell me that he and his family are OK. Um, I've been in touch with a lot of the U.K. or the uh, the Mysterious Universe writers. In fact, uh, and all of us kind of keeping in touch with regard to the current state of affairs and things. And so, yeah, for many years running, I have happily contributed to their blog because they're fine fellows and good pals and uh Again, it's a mysterious universe out there. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> well, listen, thank you again for your time today. It's been thoroughly enjoyable from start to finish. Um, it, it's been a real pleasure. Been waiting a, a long time to speak to you properly. Uh, <laughs> well, let's let's do it again soon then, all right? We'll Absolutely. keep it going. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. So, listen, you take care and stay safe out there. Likewise. Thank you, brother. <laughs>